Amazon is the latest tech giant to face an antitrust case in the United States. What are the charges against the company? A high-level meeting was held at the United Nations to discuss the fight against tuberculosis. Where are we at in controlling this disease? And finally, Egypt is set to hold presidential elections in December and Abdel Fateh El Sisi looks set to win a third term. What explains his vice-like grip on the country? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And if you're watching this on YouTube, before you go any further, please hit the subscribe button. The Federal Trade Commission in the United States and 17 states are suing tech giant Amazon for creating a monopoly. In this landmark case, Amazon stands charged with unfairly promoting its own platform and services and engaging in business practices that led users to pay more. Amazon may have become a vital part of life for many, many of us in many countries in the world, but activists have long called out a number of its practices for being both anti-labor and anti-consumer. While trade unions across the world have been fighting the company for its violations of workers' rights, this case has put the focus on its monopolistic practices. We go to Anish for more. Anish, very interesting times. We saw a case against Google being launched a few uh, weeks ago by the Department of Justice, I believe, and now the FTC, which has been in the news a lot uh, in when it comes to issues of antitrust and monopolies, is now going against Amazon. So maybe could you first give us a very, uh, from a layman's perspective, a very a brief idea of what really the case against Amazon is? Well, it's a slightly more complicated than, say, uh, what uh, other kind of uh, similar antitrust uh, cases or litigations have happened with the FTC, uh, say, against Google or even much earlier against Microsoft. Because when it comes to Amazon, Amazon is pretty much a retail platform as well. It's not just, uh, uh, you know, a tech giant. So that is one of the issues where it comes. Uh, primarily, uh, the, uh, the issue boils down to how it acts to pretty much cut out, cut off all competition uh, in, of any kind of competition, uh, not just among its sellers but also pretty much every uh, all of its cash material. So what it does is, it, uh, like some of the practices that Amazon says is like standard retail practices, uh, like, uh, you know, bringing down, uh, bringing up discounts, uh, bringing down prices so that, uh, you know, the, it will, prices become more attractive. But other than that, you also have issues of them actually, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, some of the uh, uh, allegations that have been raised is just like, uh, they would kick out or threaten sellers in their own platforms if they are selling, uh, you know, outside of uh, Amazon at a much cheaper rate. And that is possible because obviously sellers have to uh, put up a big share of their sales to Amazon. And very often it's much cheaper for them to sell outside of Amazon, uh, even though they do not want to, uh, you know, completely do away with that option. Uh, they also kick out uh, sellers uh, for, uh, you know, punish sellers if they uh, from their fulfillment centers. Fulfillment centers are basically warehouses, storage units, which also uh, conduct uh, delivery services for the for these sellers, where you can send your products, and then uh, you know Amazon does pretty much the packaging, the delivery, uh, you know, warehousing everything for them. Uh, but it obviously comes with a higher share price, and that is pretty much one of the other ways that they punish sellers. They also punish sellers if the same products that they sell is sold by others or any other platform at much lower rate. And that is also something that pretty much basically punishes sellers, uh, you know, uh, dictates their rates, dictates them of how they want to, uh, you know, conduct their business. And it pretty much, uh, so Amazon, Amazon, uh, you know, stops being just a retail platform. It basically becomes the sort of monopolistic, uh, you know, mega corporation that is controlling all sorts of, you know, mom and pop shop stores around the country. Well, in this context also, what are the, what, what is likely to happen, for instance, if say the case against Amazon succeeds, if Amazon is found guilty of this kind of anti, uh, this kind of monopolistic behavior? It's very difficult to say because, uh, uh, like, let's begin with the fact that uh, it's very, uh, it is not that likely. Like, there are, it's a 50 50 chance at, at how things stand right now for Amazon to be even convicted 
of monopolistic behavior. But even if it does get, uh, you know, convicted of it, uh, you know, it's it's more likely that they will be let off with a fine. And that is pretty much been like that has pretty much been the most uh, stringent of practices that we have seen in the West, where uh, monopolies have been allowed as long as corporates. Uh, are willing to pay a couple of million dollars or a hundred million dollars in fines. And we have seen that in Europe, the US is it's far worse. We have seen many big tech companies uh, completely going scot-free. And the fact that Amazon is fighting this case and not trying to you know, come up with a settlement uh, with the FTC or with a compromise, or even, you know, preempt the entire uh, lawsuit by actually uh, creating its own, uh, you know, adjustments in its own structure and process clearly shows that it expects to win very uh, easily from this entire litigation. And that speaks uh, volumes about the, about how capitalism functions in the United States, where monopolies are allowed uh, as long as they're big enough uh, to actually pay their way through the system. Yeah, and it's interesting because uh, what Amazon has thrived on is, of, of course, one, by offering convenience to users, two, sometimes offering low prices in various ways. But we also know that uh, behind this, there is this whole system of very exploitative labor. We have seen labor movements across the world take up you know, very powerful actions against Amazon. Uh, people have been suffering in various parts of the world. There's a Make Amazon Pay campaign, for instance. And now there's an interesting kind of a move that has sort of come out uh, come out against Amazon in terms of trying to target it from its monopolistic perspective. So uh, thank you so much for talking to us and we'll definitely be tracking this issue as time passes because it's definitely one of the more interesting cases of our time. Thank you so much. So much. The UN General Assembly held its second high-level meeting on the fight against tuberculosis on September 22nd. It couldn't have been more timely. TB kills approximately 1.5 million people a year and is the most deadly infectious disease according to experts. The fight against the disease is complicated by the emergence of a drug-resistant strain which is more difficult to cure. There are also questions if the global community is doing enough to ensure the availability of medicines. We go to Jyotsna Singh for more. Jyotsna, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, quite a lot on the health agenda at the UN General Assembly, though that's not often talked about so much as the geopolitical issues. So maybe let's first start with the discussion around TB itself. We know that uh, the important, uh, recently, for instance, TB became the most deadly infectious disease once again. There's been a lot of discussion around medication. So what were the kind of discussions at this high level summit on TB? Uh, so Prashant, uh, uh, during the UN uh, General Assembly, there was a resolution uh, that was passed on tuberculosis. Um, and uh, as always, the thing is that, uh, firstly, it was in 2018 that the first such resolution was passed. It was for the first time that the UN General Assembly had taken up TB as a major issue. Uh, so, And also it was in the context of drug-resistant TB, which has been uh, increasing across the world in the last uh, uh, 15 years or so. So UN did take uh, note of that um, and it happened. And um, during this particular uh, General Assembly, the idea was to take stock of the situation. Where have we come uh, in the last uh, five to six years and what is to be done? Now, firstly, the problem is that uh, we, uh, more on most of the targets that the UN had set, uh, UN is fa has failed. Uh, the UN has said the, the the world leaders have failed badly. Uh, for example, the idea was to raise a fund of five billion dollars a year uh, for research and development and other things to be done for tuberculosis. Uh, we are far far short of it. We are nowhere close. Um, and the, constantly the reason given is that you know COVID nineteen pandemic that started to, uh, that uh, did not allow much progress uh, on the TB front. Uh, so while, of course, because of uh, COVID, uh, tuberculosis faced a lot of uh, uh, back, uh, I mean, uh, it went, we lost a lot of decades of progress that uh, we can't deny. But at the same time, even before that, the data shows that we were not really meeting the targets. Um, so it is not good to just put it on the pandemic, but also what is the, are the world leaders doing if they're not investing enough money on the deadliest of the disease. And just to give you an example, every year 1.6 million people die 
of tuberculosis and that is same as the population of manhattan so we are losing a manhattan a year to tuberculosis and um, but in terms of uh, the political will one does not see and 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 it is the same thing that we are seeing now also um, in the declaration it has some good words it again talks about the same targets it is again saying that we will meet the targets but by 2030 um, but we also know that in the past few years the progress has been dismal and um, there is no reason to believe it will change because um, the declaration doesn't really talk about the fact that you know you have something like intellectual property barriers etc which uh, uh, need to be addressed more investment definitely has to be made there has to be some words which talk about making things mandatory on part of the governments and especially the developed countries to do so that uh, tuberculosis uh, we can get rid of it by 2030 but we do not see any of that strong language coming in the declaration yeah Right, Jyotsna. I believe also there were other discussions, including on the pandemic treaty, some of which, uh, you know, turned out to be a bit controversial. Also, could you maybe tell us what that is about as well? Yes. Uh, so there were three more topics which were related to health that were part of UNGA and the declarations were made. Uh, the pandemic treaty, of course, is one of them. Then SDGs, which also has some portions regarding uh, health, uh, and then the universal health coverage. Uh, so uh, to note, uh, I think. the overall political uh, you know uh, uh, things those that happen around uh, unga also shows the increasing polarization world over so 11 countries uh, actually wrote uh, to the general body and the secretariat that they are not happy with the way declarations regarding health uh have been developed and are going to be issued during this it is a very big thing 11 countries which included countries like bolivia cuba uh, iran venezuela all of these are the countries which are facing the unilateral coercive measures or unilateral sanctions by the united states uh and they all said that we are suffering badly uh, uh, because of these sanctions and the process with Uh, 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 with which the un itself is working is very problematic um, so they wrote that uh, there is no democratic process through which these declarations have been arrived at russia also joined uh, this group of 11 countries and they made uh, major objections to it so uh, it is like uh, these countries actually represent one third of the population of the earth uh, so uh, they have not agreed with these declarations so i think this is something to take note of and of course there are major problems especially with regard to pandemic treaty and it is because these discussions are happening at so many levels g20 uh, is discussing it we uh, uh, at the level of who we are discussing it and essentially the pandemic treaty uh, the, the way it gets framed is something which is going to guide how we will treat future pandemics which can happen uh, right um, and uh, so uh, you do not see any strong language it actually is saying that the countries should uh, have uh, domestically fund any response in future it is indicating something like this it is impossible it is the duty of the richer countries to really ensure that uh, in in a pandemic situation they do fund the poorer nations and ensure that the pandemic does not spread and it is because of their politics and their economics that the poor countries faced uh, problems during uh, uh, covid-19 so none of those learnings seem to have uh, uh, been taken on board while preparing this declaration it is so it uh, it's like it will not it is so far from anything which can lead to equity or equitable uh, access to uh, medicines medical products in the future uh, so that is a huge problem and a lot of people have objected to it my organizations like uh, uh, msf like uh, uh, aids uh, healthcare foundation they really objected to what is uh, the way uh, uh, the the declaration has come out the wordings of the declaration it does not talk about intellectual property barriers it does not say that the big pharma companies cannot really make a killing out of uh, a, a pandemic um, so it's um, it's a problematic one and uh, uh, next year when at the level of who the uh, pandemic treaty is being discussed uh, we hope that unga's declaration does not guide uh, the outcome because uh, otherwise uh, 
the poor countries will be at a losing end and uh, these countries 11 countries uh, really have taken a stand which is a strong and we hope that the other uh, developing countries follow the suit right josta thank you so much for that analysis of what happened at the un general assembly i think it ties into a lot of the issues we have been talking about at the geopolitical level as well at the level of uh, financial institutions very similar issues i think being raised when it comes to health so very important discussion to keep track of thank you so much and finally, Egypt is set to hold presidential elections from December 10th. Incumbent Abdel Fattah el-Sisi is, of course, the favorite to win what could be his third term. El-Sisi became the president in 2014 and has won two elections with such huge margins that many have questioned if they were even fair. The same concerns remain about the upcoming elections as well. Under Sisi, both the economic condition and human rights situation have declined, but with the help of his foreign allies, he has held on to power. We go to Abdul for an early analysis. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. So, uh, elections being announced in Egypt, of course, Abdul Fattah al-Sisi has not announced his candidature yet, but widely expected that he will contest his elections uh, going for his third term. Now, uh, the key question here, of course, in everyone's minds is that what are the possibilities of this election being free and fair? Because that is a big complaint raised against previous processes. And also, how is sort of LCC kind of, you know, uh, let's use the word manipulated or changed the institutional framework of Egypt itself? Well, Prashant, uh, given the experience of the last two presidential elections under CC in Egypt in 2014 and 2018, it is uh, very unlikely that this time is going to be any different. Um, for various reasons, of course. One, uh, CC has, has this obsession of winning with huge margins and, and showing uh, to the world or the Egyptian people that he has no... A contest at all. So every time, uh, no matter what is the ground situation, CC always wins with at least 96-97% of all the votes pulled. In the last two elections, that's what happened. And um, uh, this is one. And of course, one can easily uh, uh, say that this is not uh, uh, a result which one can achieve in an election which is held free and fair. Second, uh, the election commission in Egypt makes sure that CC has no uh, uh, serious contender. Uh, uh, so it either rejects those, P, those candidates who are considered to be popular or have uh, or basically some kind of political persecution starts against anyone who shows interest uh, in participation participating in election uh, against CC and uh, contesting election against CC and and this time is again we have seen this is happening for last uh, months various uh, last few months uh, Ahmad Tantavi who is considered to be a serious contender Though his popularity is not that big that he can challenge CC, uh, has already uh, faced uh, spy uh, 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 incidents of spying on his phone uh, by the, a software which is, was made in uh, Israel. So yeah, uh, and this thing, and given the fact that the political parties have been, most of the other political parties which are considered to be ideological threats are banned and so on and so forth. As far as the institutional arrangements uh, under CC has been uh, have been done, of course, uh, uh, he he the first major uh, changes he change he did in 2019 that he amended the constitution and which basically allowed uh, him to to basically contest for presidential election for at least two more terms. Uh, and that one and uh, the term of the president which was four years before has been now increased to six years so this basically allows him if this continues to stay in power for at least 12 more years from now and that basically uh, has been done uh, uh, under cc's uh, regime yeah
Right, and Abdul, in this context, how do you sort of assess the legacy of uh, Abdul Fateh El Sisi so far? It's been, I believe, uh, close to 10 years since not now since he's uh, come to power. And, you know, quite, uh, he's really, of course, made had an impact in terms of repression, in terms of changing the country's constitution. And also a very important, other key question, I guess, is how has he sort of managed to stay in power despite all these uh, reasons for resentment against him, including the economic crisis? Well, Prashant, uh, it is uh, not very difficult uh, to know the reasons or to guess the reason that despite uh, massive uh, food and uh, other inflation in the country, uh, despite rising poverty in the country, uh, despite the fact that Egypt has been uh, on the verge of a failed state for many years now, uh, uh, CC has been has been able to uh, keep him, himself in power only through repression. Uh, there is no other uh, explanation for the uh, for that, and this is in a way a kind of reenactment of the Hosni Mubarak uh, period, despite the elections, uh, periodic elections, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, his legacy, of course, uh, uh, Sisi's legacy is basically a legacy of repression. Um, uh, he is only uh, considered to be uh, a kind of uh, a person who defeated uh, the, the massive euphoria or popular uh, uh, hope which was generated uh, post-2011 uh, 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 uprisings. Uh, and he has been able to kind of completely uh, dismantle that hope. Uh, he has, uh, if you see, he, despite the global criticism about his rep rep repressive his regimes, even from the closed, uh, closer allies like United States, um, CC has not buzzed a bit. He initiated uh, the so-called national dialogue. A uh, few year, few months back, um, in which he tried to basically, he, I mean, at least that that was the uh, uh, attempt, uh, oh, that was the stated uh, objective, to bring all the uh, uh, dissenting voices uh, on a table uh, and uh, sit and negotiate, uh, create a national consensus. Despite that process started, we don't know. Uh, where it is going, what is the fate of it, nobody knows. Uh, on one side there is national dialogue going, on the other side the activists continue to uh, uh, to be imprisoned, uh, political parties uh, which are considered to be popular or a threat to uh, CC's uh, power uh, are banned some of them are uh, declared as terrorist organizations, uh, uh, their leaders are living in exile, um, and so on and so forth. So overall, uh, if, if one uh, has to uh, say CC's uh, legacy, of course it is a legacy of repression and, and uh, a legacy of Muslim Mubarak. Uh, thank you so much, Abdul, for talking to us. We'll definitely be tracking the campaign as it proceeds as well. I guess a very, very important uh, election as far as Egypt is concerned and its future is concerned. Thank you so much. And that's all we have time for in this episode of Daily Debrief. Do come back tomorrow for a fresh episode. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you haven't hit that subscribe button on YouTube already, please do. See you tomorrow.